we're going to focus here on scoliosis. And scoliosis is an extremely common disorder. It affects about 1.2 to 3% of the population here in the United States. It does have a female preponderance, as you've probably noticed if you've worked around uh, children. So uh, usually this is an idiopathic disorder, and it's a disorder of spinal alignment, which results in a uh, right to left curvature of the uh, usually the thoracic spine, but it can affect the cervical spine, lumbar spine, um, sacral spine theoretically, but it's usually the thoracic spine that this affects. Uh, it can also be an uh, anterior posterior curvature, but usually what we're talking about here 99% of the time is right to left curvature of the uh, of the thoracic spine. As I mentioned, it's extremely common. It's about, uh, I mean, you can easily run into a uh, scoliosis patient uh, in, in daily practice and tends to have a female preponderance. We don't really know why. It's going to be noted during adolescence, uh, and it worsens until the end of skeletal maturation. So particularly during that growth spurt, which usually for females is around 10 to 12 years of age, uh, that's going to be when you start noticing the, uh, the, the prominent curvature of the back, which is unusual. And then this is just going to continue to get worse until, uh, until they're done growing. It, this doesn't stop ever. It, it continues until they are done growing and then it's fixed that way. Now there's varying severity, of course, and uh, some patients with scoliosis, it's subclinical. They don't even realize it until they're adults and maybe their, uh, their, their physician tells them, oh, hey, you have scoliosis and it was never noted, even though they had a pediatrician when they were younger. It could be that, that unsevere. Uh, now, on the other hand, it could be so severe that it affects their pulmonary function because it, uh, it contorts the, the, uh, the thoracic cavity. So you have varying degrees of severity here. And most commonly, scoliosis is idiopathic. However, there are other causes which include congenital and neuromuscular causes. So this is the normal spine. Here is just an illustration. Uh, it should be straight, 90 degrees. This is a scoliotic spine where you have curvature. And most of the time the, uh, with scoliosis, you're gonna have curvature to the right. So we're looking at the patient's backside here. This is to the right. I don't really know why it goes to the right most of the time, but that's just the way it, it happens. So history of a patient with scoliosis. As mentioned, this is more common in females. Really, it's not uh, something that you really need to look for a history for because it's, it usually presents itself right into your face. So you'll note it on physical exam. A lot of schools have screening programs for scoliosis, which then they'll be able to tell their parents to get them into a pediatrician. Uh, but again, this is just going to present to you and it's going to be apparent. There is a familial preponderance, but you certainly don't have to have a uh, family history to have scoliosis. And idiopathic scoliosis, which we're talking about here, presents during adolescence. So these are going to be uh, 10 to 12 year old girls primarily that we're, what we're talking about. Symptoms, most patients are asymptomatic other than their physical abnormality. Uh, and idiopathic scoliosis is generally non-painful. It really should be non-painful. If there is pain, it should raise suspicion for an alternative diagnosis, possibly um, something unusual uh, taking place inside one of the spines. So pain is not something that we associate with idiopathic uh, adolescent scoliosis. Physical exam, as mentioned, this is going to be somewhat straightforward. There'll be an abnormal contour of the spine, which is going to be best noted on the Adams Forward Bend test. Now, I don't know what Adams did to get his name added onto this test, but basically the Forward Bend test, you're going to be bending forward. And what you'll also notice is that there may be unlevel shoulders and the scapula may protrude uh, on, uh, on the other end. So the tendency, as mentioned, is for a right-sided thoracic curve, 
And the neurologic exam is going to be absolutely quintessential whenever you have a patient with scoliosis because we want to know is this idiopathic scoliosis or is this neuromuscular scoliosis. Neuromuscular scoliosis is associated with a particular, with particular lesions of the upper motor neurons. And so when you're doing your neurologic exam, you want to look out for upper motor neuron signs. So hyperreflexia, uh, abnormal reflexes like Babinski, uh, and then gait abnormalities. So we definitely want to differentiate out neurologic scoliosis, uh, neuromuscular scoliosis rather, from the general idiopathic scoliosis that predominates. This is a scoliometer. This is what you can use clinically to determine the angle of scoliosis. However, you can also use an x-ray to do that. And then this is a, uh, a young girl with uh, signs of scoliosis. So you can see here the uneven shoulders, the, uh, the curve in the spine here. Again, this is going to the right. And then you can see the protrusion of the scapula on the, uh, on the ipsilateral side to the curve. And then there are also uneven hips, so the left hip is higher than the right hip. So what you gain in your scapula, you lose in your hips, basically, as far as height. Diagnosis is ascertained clinically. This is, like I said, really straightforward. However, it's uh, mandatory that you get uh, AP and lateral spinal x-rays, so that is the best initial diagnostic step. Even though you can really make this diagnosis clinically, you don't technically need x-rays to make the diagnosis. You have to get them because they have to be uh, obtained to monitor progress. So please note that adolescent idiopathic scol uh, scoliosis, as uh, talked about before, will have an unremarkable neurologic examination. If you do have upper motor neuron signs, then you're thinking about uh, you're, you're thinking about neuromuscular scoliosis or possibly syringomyelia, and so in that case, you're going to want to get an MRI uh, in addition to the x-rays, of course. So that's why I differentiated it out, because it's going to be a, it's going to be a, a different workup. So the severity of the curvature should be obtained with a scoliometer, and you can also get it with your, uh, with your x-ray. Uh, but both of those are going to be useful in determining the degree of curve, which is going to impact um, how, how far we go in treating the patient. So here's scoliosis here. This is looking from the back. So uh, this is the right, right here. Um, you can see the cardiac silhouette here going to the left. So this is the right. So this is curving to the right. And here's another one, a little bit more severe here, curving to the right. This is really, really bad. So here's another one. This one you're looking from the front here. And so you can draw a line right down the middle of the spine. And then you can draw a line through the, the most curvy part of the uh, curvature. And that's going to tell you approximately uh, what your angle is here, and this is verging on 45 degrees, and 45 degrees is where we start mandating uh, surgical therapy or where it's recommended. So the differential diagnosis for scoliosis is, uh, of course, uh, congenital scoliosis, uh, which is different from adolescent scoliosis. With congenital scoliosis, it is noted uh, from birth, from childhood. So this is something that it doesn't take until adolescence, doesn't appear at adolescence. This is something that you'll note when the child's two, three, four years old. Neuromuscular scoliosis, as mentioned previously, it's going to appear outwardly similar. It'll look, it'll look like scoliosis, and indeed it is scoliosis, but it's, it's not the same cause. In this case, you have lesions to the upper motor neurons and often to the DCML tract. And this is going to result in hyperreflexia and primitive reflexes, as well as gait abnormalities. With uh, another thing that can cause scoliosis is a syringomyelia, which is a, uh, basically a cyst in the central canal of the spine. And this will also result in an abnormal neurologic examination. With most syringomyelias, you will have a cape-like distribution of loss of pain, temperature, and sensation. And not all patients who get syringomyelias have scoliosis, but you can have patients 
uh, who have syringomyelia that do develop scoliosis, particularly if they're children. So this is something, another thing, along with neuromuscular scoliosis, to differentiate out. If you have an abnormal neurologic exam, you're going to think either neuromuscular scoliosis or syringomyelia. And if you have that abnormal neurologic exam, as mentioned previously, it's going to warrant further investigation, and that's going to be done with an MRI. That will help you determine if there are lesions uh, on the neurologic tracts uh, or if there's uh, a syrinx present. What do we do for treatment? Now, therapy is usually non-surgical, but depending on the severity, we may pursue surgical routes, or it may become necessary at a certain point if uh, the therapy, the more conservative therapy is not working. So if you have a less than 20 degree curvature, then it's just going to be simply observation. If it's 20 to 45 degrees, then we use bracing, uh, particularly if it's a very young child in which there's lots of room for the scoliosis to get worse. We want to make sure that we prevent that from happening. And if there's more than 45 degrees of curvature, then in most cases, surgical options are, are going to be pursued. And what we do is surgical spinal arthrodesis. And arthrodesis is just uh, fusing the, uh, uh, the spines together so that they don't continue to migrate into that curve. Now, the therapy is not going to be focused on re reversing the curvature. We can't do that. But what it does is it prevents progression. And that's important because scoliosis is something that gets worse and worse and worse as, as the, the child uh, develops. So we want to prevent further progression. Now, uh, other things that we can do for treatment are going to include regular exercise, including focusing on core strength. We want to make sure that we're strengthening uh, those paraspinal muscles. And then complications from the spinal arthrodesis include, as in any surgery, postoperative infection, iatrogenic neurologic damage, since we're dealing around the area of the spinal cord, and then a surgery that doesn't take. And this is what those, uh, what those bracings look like, the harness for scoliosis. So you can see here that it's something that uh, a girl can wear, uh, or a boy for that matter, can wear under their normal clothes. Uh, and this will, uh, will prevent the, uh, the spine from continuing to migrate in the scoliotic pattern. And that's it.